It's great to be here. Um, I first like to thank the organizers and the many staff uh, who made this conference possible. The, the organization was really, really good. Uh, and I would also like to thank uh, Nathan Brown for having constructed such a precise context for discussion and, uh, and disagreement. Um, and so the starting point provided here uh, by the title no doubt alludes to the definition given by the Eleatic stranger in the Sophist, in Plato's Sophist, for existence. I quote, I suggest that everything which possesses any power of any kind, either to produce a change in anything of any nature or to be affected even in the least degree by the slightest cause, though it, though it be only on one occasion, has real existence. For I set, set, up, uh, for I set up as a definition which defines being that is nothing else than power. So, uh, end quote. So in, in, the, in the crucial sort of end of this sort of middle section of the sophist, um, Plato has the LA, Alex Stranger make this definition of existence, which is a power, capacity to affect and to be affected. So this follows after a heated discussion of what it means for the false to exist. Indeed, speak, um, to speak of the existence of the false is to speak of its power. But what is this power? The irrationality of the false follows from the condition set out earlier by the stranger when he asserts that, quote, you recognize that he who says something must say one thing. And then a few lines later, uh, he says again, when I called it, that is to say non-being, irrational, inexpressible, and unspeakable, I address, I address my speech to it as singular, end quote. Hence, the stranger continues, quote, if, if one is to speak incorrectly, one must not define it as either singular, to, speaking of non-being, uh, as either singular or plural, and must not even call it it at all. For in this manner of referring to it, one would be giving form of the, giving it form of the singular, end quote. Hence, to speak of non-being is to speak falsely. But the existence of the false also allows us to grasp the specific difference in this instance, the point that the Eleatic Stranger wants to make, between discourse, that is to say speech, and thought. The stranger explains, quote, although I maintain that not, not, non-being or not being could have nothing to do with either the singular or plural, that is to say it, it, it can't be addressed to as one thing, and since it can't be addressed as one thing, it, it also can't be addressed as many, many things. Then I undertook to attach the verb to be to non-being, I was contradicting what I said, what I said before. When I attached the verb, uh, the verb to it, did I not address it in the singular? And when I called it irrational, inexpressible, and unspeakable, I addressed my speech to it as singular. But we say that if one is to speak correctly, one must not define it as either singular or plural, and must not even call it it at all. For given by this manner of referring to it, one would be giving it the form of the singular. The, the difference here is that though nothing can be said of not being, that nothing can be said of not being which would not be false speech, but it can be thought in a certain manner. That is to say, it can be thought in precisely that manner. That is, it can be thought along the lines of what distinction uh, can, what, what kind of distinction can be between speaking of non-being and thinking it? That is, detached thinking from the rule of discourse frees it to consider the limits of the discourse itself. Hence, the false is the occasion of separating thought from discourse, and it is a subtraction uh, of this uh, thinking from the one, which is the, 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 the domain of, the, of, the, of discourse. Um, in what follows, I'd like to more closely examine another form of this power of the false, that is to say, this power of an en encounter that allows us to free thinking from the one. Um, that, is, uh, that is, I treat the infinite, that is to say, I treat this specific kind of falsity. Like non-being, the infinite has always been thought along the lines of the irrational, inexpressible, and the unspeakable. Indeed, to speak of the infinite, either as singular or plural, lands us directly in contradiction or falsity. 
That is, one could perhaps borrow from Hegel the, the different ways of speaking of the infinite, that is to say, in, in the bad infinite, uh, distinction between a bad infinite, die schlechte Unendlichkeit, and the good infinite, die extra uh, Unendlichkeit. So we must dispense with the larger issue of Hegel's distrust of, the math, of mathematics as such and the mathematical infinite and approach directly to the discussion uh, of that significant portion of the science of logic dedicated to this, the, the falsity and the effect of the bad infinite. So let us first achieve some small clarity on the distinction between good and bad infinity. I quote Hegel, the infinite as consummated return into, into self, the relation of itself to itself is being, but not only the indeterminate abstract being, for it is posited as negating the negation. It is therefore only determinate being, for it contains negation in general and hence determinateness. It is, it is and is there present before us. It is and is there present before us. It is only the spurious infinite or the, the bad infinite, which is the beyond, because it is only the negation of the finite posited as real. As such, it is the abstract first negation, determined only as negative, the affirmation of the determinant being is lacking in it, the spurious infinite or the, the bad infinite. So what is beyond this self-relating form of negation? Since all means of grasping the infinite as separate from finitude necessarily limits the f infinite form of the finite, the infinite must be a relation of this limit to itself through its overcoming. That is, if a bounded thing supersedes its bounds, then it is precisely in relating this supersession as the imminent reality of that thing that infinity is genuine, or the good one. Um, finitude and infinite constitutes uh, something of a dynamical inseparability here. Hegel argues that, quote, um, quote the reason why understanding is so antagonistic to the unity of the finite and the infinite is simply that it presupposes the limitation and the infinite, as well as the in itself, as perpetuated in doing, as, as perpetuated in doing so. Oh, sorry. It's long, Hegel's long sentences. Um, sorry, let me go back. Quote, the, the reason why understanding is so antagonistic to the unity of finite and infinite is simply that it presupposes the limitation and the infinite as well as the in itself as perpetuated in doing so, it overlooks the negation of both that which is actually present in the infinite progress as also the fact that they occur therein only as moments for a while and that they come on the scene only by means of their opposite but essentially only the means of the sublation of their opposite. Um, at the same time, to say that the infinite and the finite are one is to mistake just as, is a mistake just as much as to say the infinite and the finite are distinct determinations. Um, and here Hegel asserts that the unity, okay, this is a crazy sentence. The unity and the, of the, the unity of the finite and infinite and the distinction between them are just as inseparable as finitude and infinity. So that is to say, the, the thinking together of infinity and finitude and the thinking apart of infinity and finitude is as enmeshed as infinity and infinitude itself. So, um, so, so Hegel, frames the distinction, this kind of distinction between the good and infinite via reference to Spinoza. In, uh, in Hegel's um, remarks uh, and the, the passage of the to remarks, Spinoza figures heavily and especially the famous letter on the infinite to uh, um, uh, Louis Mayer, um, oftentimes called variously letter 12 or letter 29, something like that, depending on the ed edition. Um, where Spinoza distinguishes different senses of infinite by reference to an example of two nested non-concentric circles. This is the figure I have here. There's the outer circle and there's the inner circle and they're not concentric. Okay. Um, Spinoza's example was meant to make use of the in inequality between the properties of the two circles 
to show that the sum of the differences is mathematically infinite. So you can sort of think of the inequality between the relation between point CD there and point AB up top as, uh, as allowing uh, the inner circle to project outwards, thus making uh, these uh, unequal lines. And every line is going to be different as it crosses the, goes around the, the, the circumference if it's, if it's non-concentric. So there Spinoza says, it is evident, I quote, it is evident from what has been said that, either no, that neither number nor measure nor time being mere aids to the imagination can be infinite for otherwise number would not be number nor measure measure nor time time. It is abundantly, abundantly evident why, why many who confuse these three abstraction, abstractions with realities though being ignorant of the true nature of things, have actually denied the infinite. The wretchedness of their reasoning, I, this is still Spinoza here, the wretchedness of their reasoning may be judged by the mathematicians who have never allowed themselves to be delayed a moment by arguments of this sort. In the case of things which are clearly and, and distinctly perceived, for not only do they come across many things which cannot be expressed by number, thus showing the inadequacy of number for determining things, but also that they have found many things which cannot be equaled by number, but surpass every possible number. But they, hence, they infer hence that such things surpass enumeration, not because the multitude of the component parts, but because their nature cannot, without manifest contradiction, be expressed in terms of number. As for instance, the case of these two circles, uh, non-concentric, whereof one encloses the other. No number can express the inequality of distance which exists between the two circles, nor all the variations which matter in motion in the intervening space may undergo. The conclusion is not based on the excessive size of the intervening space. And that's, that's an important point because it, the infinity doesn't come out because of the largeness of it, but precisely because of the specific kind of relation between these two these two figures. Well, it's one figure, but the, the two circles. However small a portion of it we take, the inequalities of this portion will surpass any numerical expression. Nor, again, is the conclusion based on the fact, as in other cases, that we do not know the maximum and the minimum of that said space. It, simply it springs simply from the fact that the nature of the space between two non-concentric circles cannot be expressed in number. So here, um, Spinoza exploits um, the fact that whenever you move up to a higher dimension, um, you, it, you know, the, the, the objects of the smaller dimension can never add up to being big enough. So there's a certain uh, incommensurability there. And he's exploring this fact, you know, how many points are there in a line? One, one, could, might, one might sort of say there are an infinite number. How many lines are in a plane? Uh, also, and this is, uh, this is the kind of case that he exploits. So, you know, all of these lines, infinite in number, is supposed to express that space, which is a, a, of a higher dimension. So he's, he's exploiting this um, notion of infinity as a kind of placeholder for the relation between different dimensions, uh, things which, you know, at the first glance have no, have no relation. Um, so if we take the difference between, oh, okay, I kind of talked through that already. So he, hence Spinoza provides an ex example typical of classical infinite paradoxes that c compares lines of space to disc discrete parts to holes. That is to, this is clear enough in Hegel's understanding of Spinoza's example. Hegel, Hegel says, uh, quote, it is evident that Spinoza rejects the concept of the infinite which represents it as an amount or a series which cannot be completed. And he points out that, that here, in the space of his example, the infinite is not beyond, but actually present and complete, quote, end quote. So given what I've quoted from Spinoza and given what I've said, I've quoted here from Hegel, it's clear that Hegel misunderstands Spinoza. Uh, insofar as the latter makes it clear that mathematicians have not, that Spinoza makes it clear that mathematicians have not fallen into this trap. Spinoza here is on the side of the mathematician who claim for the mathematical infinite, who, who do not claim for the mathematical infinite any specific status. Hegel and Spinoza hence agree on the example, but place the mathematicians 
in different camps. So this misreading of Spinoza is relatively minor to Hegel's general aim. Um, his use of Spinoza is, uh, in short, one of, one of agreement. Um, and I quote again from, from Hegel, Spinoza calls the infinite of a series the infinite of the imagination, what we've already seen in the quote. On the other hand, the infinite as self-relation he calls the infinite of thought, or infinitum actu. It is namely actu, actually infinite, because it's complete and present within, within itself. This goes back to, end quote. This, this goes back to the uh, distinction between genuine and uh, good and bad infinite before, because the good infinite is that which is complete and uh, related to itself. So we shall then call, uh, so the mathematical infinite diagnosed by Hegel via Spinoza is also a misnomer insofar as Spinoza himself does not think that the math mathematicians have made such a mistake for conflating the indefinite, which is the, the series, the, the, you know, the series that never ends, the, the, the number that is as uh, a number bigger than any number you can give, uh, with the infinite. So we'll call this the bad infinite, following Hegel's term, with the caveat that although Hegel associates this with, mathemat with, with mathematics specifically, that is a, a, that is a misunderstanding. Um, so nonetheless, Spinoza does provide two versions of the infinite, the infinite self-relation and the infinite qua indefinite. Hegel's further criticism of Spinoza is that the latter does not go far enough with the philosophical and metaphysical infinite, which is, for Hegel, equally insufficient. That is, the philosophical infinite remains only on the abstract level of the absolute taken as negation of negation of the de indefinite. Hence, the Spinoza's infinite only negates the mathematical indefinite rather than rending the true uh, superiority or the transcendence of the infinite to this negation. Um, this, as Hegel remarks, quote, with Spinoza, substance and its absolute unity has the form of an inert unity, i.e. A, a unity which is not self-mediated, of a fix, uh, fix, fixity or rigidity in which the notion of the negative unity of the self or subjectivity is still lacking. End quote. Mere negation of the indefinite renders true infinity waiting in the wings. Um, its entry into the scene requires a more concrete form of this dynamism of self-mediation. The genuine infinite in Hegel requires the sublation of the two we have been discussing here. A simple negation of the infinite qua immediate infinite and an alternating determination of the finite as, uh, as one-sided infinite. Uh, that is to say, the tra this transcending sublation of the genuine infinite, which is, um, I quote again from Science of Logic, um, that finitude is only a, sorry, finitude is only as a transcending of itself. It therefore contains unity, uh, it contains infinity, the other of itself. Similarly, infinity is only as a transcending of the finite. It is therefore essentially, it therefore essentially contains its other and is conse consequently in its own self the other of itself. The finite cannot be sublated by the infinite as by a power existing outside of it. On the contrary, the infinity consists in sublating of its own self. Um, Hegel's distinction between the good and the bad then placed, a, um, placed on the crucial form of, that the inf uh, of, of infinity which, um, in which the certain qualitative feature of, the inf of infinity stands over its quanti quantita quantitative feature that it somehow expresses numerically. That is, the infinite is a kind of relation, but a relation that relies not on some pre-given infinite object, but rather the way in which finite things come into relation. Hence, the pre-given unity of self-relation quality governs over the distinction between good and bad infinity. And via Hegel's discussion of Spinoza and also his long discussion in the science of logic, the problem of the infinite remains that of an impure relation. And the bad infinity is what expresses this impurity, um, which, which is what makes it bad. Um, this kind of interminable uh, addition of, 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 of yet another that does never builds beyond that. Um, and it remains always on the level of, of quantity. So the relation of quality and quantity is such that a quantitative relation could never be established on this basis. Um, so 
any grounds of infinity on this account is false. Any, any grounds for providing inf uh, a concept of infinity that is not this self-relation is false precisely because it renounces the form in which the infinite is given. The infinite as one is mere contradiction. It is only maintaining the oppositional relation between the finite, uh, between finite things that the infinite can be thought. So the, the, the issue isn't so being able to distinguish the good and the bad infinite is, is the capacity to be able to maintain the opposition that gives rise to the concept itself, this problematic uh, opposition that you know, shouldn't be reduced to mere uh, contradiction. Here, the historical examination of the infinite could uh, shed some light because it brings together, um, sorry, excuse me. So the historical examination of the infinite uh, brings together mathematics and philosophy in a natural way because, because the historical forms of the infinite were indissociable from its per peculiar form of presentation, that is, the, the form of the paradox. And it is through this form of the paradox that the infinite is always used, whether in a problematic or non-problematic way. Even in its, simpler form, in, in its simplest form, the form of the, the paradox, the liar's paradox, we have a reflexivity that is not simply to be reduced to contra contradiction, but in, in fact involves an indeterminate loop of infinite regression. Here, certainly, the difference between the ancient classical ambiguity between the, the term indefinite or the infinite, um, i.e. Uh, aperion, made the concept an essentially, and I'm going to use the term, syn syncategorimatic one. And this, this term means basically that the infinite is only an object within hypothetical limits um, and not something that exists outside of a theorized form. So this is perhaps more clearly put in the xenonic paradoxes where one attempts or you know, one sees the mapping of the relation between two kinds of things, disc discrete things and continuous things. Hence, the infinite has always stood as a uh, negative indeterminate in, uh, within uh, for philosophy. That is to say, the mode of treating the infinite can only, can at least be distinguished then in two, two modes. Um, and this, the, these two modes is precisely what's, what's very mixed up in the history, in, in the philosophical taking up of the concept of the infinite. So one mode, which I, I call just loosely theolo uh, theological, is in short, reduces the infinite to a pre or trans discursive givenness. That is to say, God is infinite insofar as, uh, to say that God is infinite is, not, is to say nothing more than it, that, that it, it is beyond measure. Um, in the scholastic tradition, owing to the nous dianoia distinction um, in the Neoplatonists, this refers to the supra-conceptual domain of the absolute. Um, and secondly, the mathematical, if one takes the tradition of uh, Archimedes and, and Euclid, was in fact far from encumbered by such uh, a kind of distinction between uh, sub-conceptual and supra-conceptual. Um, of course, the infinite in question with the Greeks was a form of potential infinite that is, um, is a form of potential infinite, the kind that's given by, by um, Aristotle, where one never arrives at the final division, for example, to take uh, Zeno's, the Zenonic paradoxes, one never arrives at the final, final cut, as, as it were. And that this, this process goes on it, you know, provides an image of the potential infinite. And this corresponds precisely to what we've been talking about here, which is the in, indefinite. So we still don't really have a concept of the infinite yet. The mathematical, if one takes the tradition of Archimedes, was far from encumbered by such distinctions, such potential, uh, actual infinite distinctions. Of course, the infinite in question with the Greeks was a form of potential infinite, but this distinction is, is basically orthogonal to or largely irrelevant to Archimedes' concern. For the ancient problems of, uh, of quadrature and the infinite uh, and description of rectilineal figure to, to curvilineal ones, the qualification of infinite as actual and potential was really secondary. What was more important was the inherent structure of this infinite, a structure 
uh, represented precisely by making use of the form of the xenonic paradoxes. So this is a kind of approximation of uh, the kind of um, quadrature problem um, dealt with in the Archimedean um, manuals. And we see here basically the attempt to um, describe the curve, the circle, with lines, with, with straight lines. So to try to map the structure of this curved line onto the relation between straight lines. Because uh, the relation between straight lines can be calculated, uh, whereas the, the ratio of the circle to these lines were, were a mystery. But you know, if, if we already started out with, under, with thinking of it as an in, indeterminate process that will never be completed, it seems almost absurd to, to, to enter into such discussions. But what we can get out of it is actually, um, is actually to use this indeterminate relation to actually provide um, a structural relationship between, um, between mathematical objects, like such as the curved line and the straight line, or uh, such as the, actually I don't have the, no. I don't have the uh, an, a figure for um, the attempt to map uh, three-dimensional objects onto two-dimensional objects, but that's also something Archimedes does. Um, and so, um, so this is what I, I want to say that uh, what, what I would call an externalization. Um, the function of this mathematical mode of thought is thus an externalization, whereas the paradoxes of the infinite provide the external limits for reckoning the one and the multiple, in the mathematician's hand, it is, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, whereas the paradoxes of the infinite provide the external limits for reckoning the one and the multiple at the mathematician's hand, it is, it, this very move is for the philosopher what provides the matter for understanding the imminence of totality. In this, if we take a long historical view from the Eleatics to Kant's antinomies, in fact, not much has progressed in the, philo in the philosopher's infinity. Um, everything remains still stuck with this idea, also repeated by Hegel, of the mathematical infinity as a kind of indefinite, um, along, the, along the lines of the xenonic uh, infinity. So, in this sense, unless, right, in this sense, unless forced to make a philosophical statement, the mathematician has, for the most part, solved the importance of the infinite paradox as the starting place of investigation, not, at a, not as its limit. Quadrature, dimensional analysis, me mechanics, etc. That is the logical qualification of the infinite qua indefinite or infinite qua actual or potential uh, has never but stood at the limits of the philosophical evaluation of mathematics. The problem of, uh, for example, mathematical roots that stood at the very beginning of systematic mathematics, the Pythagorean, um, the Pythagorean root, root two, is thus completely orthogonal to these qualifications, um, or irrelevant. Um, irrational geometric roots, transcendental roots, and the like are, are all species of the investigations of structure. The mapping of the hypotenuse to the side, or the map mapping of the radius to its circumference, or um, these provide a classification of roots, a classification of structure. This externalization occurs here precisely because the form of the presentation of the infinite presents something more positive for the mathematicians, but remain for the philosophers a, lim a limit. Again, it is not, again, the, the, the case is not that mathematicians had anything more positive to say about the infinite um, than the philosophers. In fact, they didn't. They used the infinite to allow them to talk about other things, right? to let them talk about the structure of a, a curved line in terms of straight lines, for example. Um, even with the advent of analysis in 17th, 18th centuries, the, me the, the means for treating the infinite through limits uh, in uh, Cauchy and Weierstrass and the delta epsilon uh, formulization of, of the infinitesimal calculus in the, even in this, the philosophical designation of the infinite remained imaginary or fictional and basically did not move, uh, you know, could still be described in the terms that Spinoza was describing it. So, mm, um, 
so I think um, so one could also see this kind of beautifully in the uh, dis in a in the dispute concerning the philosophical infinite um, between Galileo and Leibniz. In the first day of the two new sciences, uh, Salviati recognizes that the infinite number of all whole numbers is equal to the cardinality of any proper part of itself, like the like the set of uh, all square numbers. So that you get you take all the square numbers, all the numbers that are squares, and then you take all the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can map one uh, uh, one set to another um, completely. Right, uh, it's called bijection. And so the conclusion for, for Galileo is that the infinite number must be a number that contains all the, all the powers within itself. The infinite number is therefore one, according to Galileo. Um, on the other hand, Leibniz in, uh, in a 1673 text remarks that the infinite number cannot be one because the property of the subsets created by the multiples of three, four, five, six, eight, all the multiples of three, all the multiples of four, etc., cetera, um, cannot be contained in the properties of one. So in turn for Leibniz, the infinite number must be zero. Leibniz notes that, quote, thus the infinite is impossible, not one, not the whole, but nothing, end quote. So between Galileo and Leibniz somehow uh, lies the entire philosophical wrangling with this uh, concept in, of the indefinite. Um, so the infinite has always been a relation, the relation between con the continuous and discrete, between one dimension and a higher one. But in order to mediate this relation, the infinite was a kind of, uh, was a, had to stand as a kind of indeterminate negation. It's kind of a floating negation, which, uh, which never achieved any kind of conceptual content on its own. It designated the indefinite relation between those, those very sets of things that we were just talking about. It designated the indefinite relation between the continuous and the discrete, between one dimension and its higher one. And it designated the, you know, the indetermination, uh, indeterminate relation between thought and, and uh, the absolute. So this indeterminate relation uh, was, then, was then an indeterminate negation. It constitutes a relation formed by the negation, hence it, hence it is uh, indeterminate. There is no positive relation between the continuous and the discrete outside of its mode of presentation. The infinite thus stands in as a name for the impossible coincidence um, of, this, of this opposition. And this marks the classical differential dy dx in, in the calculus as a kind of most natural exp expression of this relation. Um, as Le Leibniz remarked on the imaginary number, this is an amphibian between being and non-being. But this relational approach only goes so far. That is, the indeterminate negation only goes so far. It remains within the paradox of the infinite. That is, it remains within the problem of the paradox as generated by the relation of objects, discrete, continuous, rectilineal, curvilineal, uh, side, uh, side angle. Um, the met met metaphysical infinite has always been, has then been the, quality of this relation of these contradicting objects. Of course, a false argument is an argument that ha lands us in infinite regression. But, it is, but if such a form of argument is to be taken as paradox and not mere contradiction, then the relation has to generate a positive relation that is subtracted from its relation, from the relation that it is generated from. We call the infinite the negative indeterminate relation, according to the xenonic paradoxes, um, for example, between the discrete and the continuous. This is because the discrete and the continuous constitutes object for us, determinate concepts limited by their definitions, their identity. Part of this definition is the very constitution of the opposition between these objects. In turn, the, the infinite standing in as the relation between them is what expresses the limits of their opposition and hence grant, grant them their objectivity. In this mode of presenting the infinite, its negative indetermination uh, is clear insofar as it is dependent on both the concept of the discrete and the concept of the continuous. Hence, 
And here the paradox presents a new way of treating the contradiction between discrete and continuous. It expresses their difference in a structural way. Rather than taking them as pre-given entities, we see reflexively that the paradox generates a form of difference of its own. Hence, in the classical mode, the relation uh, is, is, as I said, an impure, an impure one. The relation is tied to their relata reflexively. And hence, we take a forward step into relation itself. This observation allows us to determine two crucial different forms of uh, different forms in thinking the infinite. Again, what I'm interested here is not the notion of the infinite as such, but the form of the relativity or negativity uh, that generates them. Um, so, so a first form um, attempts to absorb difference transcendentally by providing a conceptual framework that manages this relation. This nicely captures, is nicely captured in the concept of the potential infinite. We say, yes, the points constitutes a line, potentially, because we can Im imagine an indeterminate end or limit to this kind of mapping. But this potential uh, infinite is limited um, is limited, wait, a form of difference. Right, this, uh, this, this potential form of the infinite is limited insofar as it, it um, cannot, it is incapable of grounding itself conceptually, but depends on the ontological priority of the things that it's, being, that it's wanting to relate. So it depends ontologically on the objects, the relata, that generates it. So this is the kind of thing we've been looking at up to this point. So the kind of thing we found, find in Spinoza and also in Hegel. The second, in or, inaugurated by um, the trio Dedekind, Cantor, and Frege, and this is, um, I, guess, I suppose, the step into so-called modern mathematics, is the structural infinite. So it's, it's the taking of, of structure as more crucial than the things being, being related. So, we can speak of, since this period, since the late 19th century, we can speak of a positive infinite in math mathematical speak, or even an actual infinite, vis-a-vis um, -vis the so-called uh, you know, Cantor's paradise that uh, David Hilbert uh, gave, said in a speech. But Dedekin, I argue, presents not so much a, a, a revolution in, in, in the content of the concept, of the content of the concept, but rather a revolution in method. Um, that is, I argue that Dudekin produces a deracination of negativity of the infinite as a relation torn away from the relata. So this, is, uh, this results in a theory of structure. Though I speak primarily of Dudekin, I want to say the structural mode of thinking can also be traced back in some ways by a subterranean passage uh, backwards to its antiquity. Um, and I've been fascinated recently by um, uh, work on Archimedes, uh, Archimedes' Method, which is a book that was lost for 2,000 plus years and recently uh, rediscovered and, uh, and, and being deciphered, uh, where um, in the Method, Proposition 14, Archimedes' uh, um, deals with triangles inside of a prism and the lines inside, um, uh, is, he's, I don't have the figure here, but he, he tries to do this, with this strange uh, object called the hoof, which is a kind of cylinder inside of a, a, a cube. And then he makes a kind of side a diagonal cut inside of the cylinder, uh, resulting in a kind of uh, ellipse on the surface, but a set of triangles going through the cylinder, it's kind of hard to describe with my hands. But, but uh, there, there he, um, right, so there, there he, he, he relates the triangles inside of a prism and the lines inside of the triangle. Um, and what's surprising about this text is that we know from a contemporary perspective that this is, this is correct. Um, but, but, we can also say that maybe Archimedes, what Archimedes, Archimedes is claiming here isn't necessarily any direct statement of an infinite quantity per se, but a different way of treating the relation between the structure of things going from n dimensions to n, n plus one dimensions. 
Um, and that was a little detour. I'm going to make another detour by talking uh, about the Mino. Um, so this kind of thing, this kind of thinking where one simply maps one set of things with another set of things and trying to see what's, what is given by the map is, um, is the kind of class, is the notion, classical notion of the slave's knowledge. So this is uh, the kind of thing that Mino's slave knows, um, that he didn't know he, he knows, but he, he, he knows it. So what Socrates demonstrates to, to Mino is that the slave boy has a knowledge of relation, relations. In particular, this is the relation of the diagonal um, to the side of the square. Um, and we could maybe, I would, I would maybe want to call this uh, a, 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 f a distinct form of knowledge called the slave's knowledge. Um, and just also to, to add to the, the idea behind this as a particular form of knowledge, uh, Leibniz has a, has a similar dialogue where he asks a child if he knew the number of noses in, this, uh, the, number of noses in the city. Uh, the child is ignorant of this. Then he asks uh, if the child knew the number of ears in the city. And of course, the child doesn't know. Um, um, but then he asks the child if he knows, knows the relation between the number of noses and the number of ears in the city. And he replies, of course, one to two, um, taking for granted that you know, people have two ears and, two, uh, and one nose. Um, and from this, Leibniz remarks that, in fact, you know, children know algebra. Um, in the same way that Plato wants, wants the, Socrates shows that the, the slave boy knows geometry, right? Um, so, so this is the kind of, of uh, this kind of, of concept of knowledge that, um, that arises from this, you know, uh, what I was calling before that, and a kind of externalization, and also a kind of uh, knowledge that proceeds through the method of mapping. Um, so back to Dedekin. Uh, in the methodological revolution produced by Dedekin is the clarification of a structural path that has, in a sense, always accompanied mathematical practice. So this is this is the slave this is the slave's knowledge that is, in fact, the mathemat mathematician's method. Um, and um, and in Was sind und was sollen die Zahlen, um, Dedekin's great work. Um, he has this very, very beautiful proof for the existence of infinity. He says, my, rel my own realm of thought, the totality S of things, so if you, he calls S the set or the system of all of his thoughts, which can be objects of my thought is, uh, is infinite. For if one of these thoughts signifies an element of S, one of these thoughts is one of the elements of the group of thoughts that he has, then the thought of that thought is also uh, a thought, right? He calls, so he has S and then he has S prime. So, so for every thought you have, thinking of that thought is also a thought. Um, and, and this is how he demonstrates um, the existence of infinity. Um, it is an application of the definition that he gives in Proposition 64. A system, I quote, a system S is said to be infinite when it's, a, it would, when it's similar to a proper part of itself. In the contrary case, S is said to be a finite system. I put this in a different terms because this is the way it's translated. Um, to, to be more precise, um, a set S is infinite if there exists a bijective function of a proper subset of S on S. So any Subcollection of its of of uh, any subcollection of the big set is mappable onto the set itself. That's an infinite set. Um, right. So a set S is infinite if it's, there exists a bijective function of a proper subset of S on S. In the contrary case, S is, is finite. So you see one of the beautiful things about Dedekind's. Um, definition here is, in fact, that he defines the finite by the infinite rather than the other way around. Um, and in brief, this approach is precisely to objectify the relation, um, the difficult relation um, found within, within the traditional xenonic paradoxes. That is, 
in the traditional, neg uh, the, the traditional negative limit of the concept of the infinite was a contradiction by which a proper part of the to totality is equal to itself. So what Dedekind basically does is he takes what is contradictory for the, class, for the, for the classic, uh, classical thinkers, and he makes it the definition of the infinite itself and defines the finite in terms of that. Um, so again, just to reiterate, take for, for instance, the set of all natural numbers, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then we take only the evens, 2, 4, 6, 8, you know, 10, uh, and then only the odds, 1, 3, 5, 6, these are all, you know, all, the evens belong into the, the natural numbers, but then we can achieve a kind of um, bijective relation, a complete one-to-one -one ordering of that part of the larger uh, set to itself. That's what defines the infinite. The infinite. Um, so we have a complete mapping, but uh, you know, whereas it constituted a contradiction for the Greeks, uh, we have a foundational definition based on this thing that at one point existed as, as in the form of a contradiction. Um, so this goes much further in the development of modern mathematics insofar as um, we come to realize that actually we, uh, we, we, we've been working with a very imprecise notion of number. So that today the number isn't, you know, there are multiple expressions, for example, for two. There's two. Uh, there's, you know, four over two. There's, you know, eight over four, et cetera, et cetera. You know, how, how do all of these things, uh, how do all of these things refer to one unique uh, reference? And it's through this, uh, this, this mode of, of mapping that we are able to classify um, what um, is called equivalence classes, uh, which uniquely refer to the numbers that we're so familiar with. So in fact, before this kind of method methodological revolution, I claim uh, we never really had a concept of even f uh, of, of the finite even. So um, I would like just to remark on three problems here. First, uh, in the figure of the infinite once removed from its paradoxical form, also constitutes a remove removal of the mis um, a demystification of the infinite as the ambiguous stand-in for the gaps in determination. So this, is, uh, this removes the infinite from the position of the negative uh, indeterminate. The infinite is determinate insofar as the structure is determinate. The priority of the relation, which constitutes infinite, above the relata. And so this is also to follow a term um, of, of Alain Badiou, uh, a banalization of the infinite. The banalization constitutes the seeds of a philosophical method, and it is, um, it is the employment of, um, of a kind of reflexivity against refle reflexivity. That is uh, to say, the employment of the dynamics of the negative arising through reflexivity in order to address a new form of thought orthogonal to the grounds in which negatively arise. So roughly speaking, that is the, 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 the story behind what I've been trying to um, describe here is that um, the the oppositions, the set of opposition that gave rise to the infinite, um, has been used for centuries, uh, millennia, as a kind of starting place for mathematical practice that wasn't, you know, that didn't really care about these, that didn't really care about the the grounds from which it it came out, the the logical. Uh, incompatibility uh, uh, that the infinite represents. Um, and what occurs, what has occurred in modern mathematics is precisely the way in which the infinite has been deracinated or torn, torn away from this ground. This, and, and I think this provides a methodological alternative to, um, uh, well, it creates, it, it constitutes a specific kind of philosophical methodology, which is that which is at the one time sensitive to neg negation and sensitive to contradiction, sensitive to, to opposition, but which allows thought to take the, the, those negativities out from the grounds that generated them. 
and um, and that's what I roughly uh, describe following uh, again Badiou as um, a subtraction. So so um, in general, the subtractive mode of Badiou's thinking has been taken into um, either a kind of strange neoplatonic, uh, sort of neo neoplatonic uh, thing of 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 being something tantamount to abstraction, where uh, incidental qualities are somehow removed in order to have a kind of generic thing. But I think it really has much more to do with this, his way of dealing with negation, and I think this history of the infinite um, allows us to illustrate this. Um, so that, um, so that, for example, we start with a, a you know, um, contradiction is what draws our attention to a set of oppositions, and then, but then, you know, the, the grounds that generated this opposition is incapa incapable of resolving it. It has to be taken out. It has been drawn out and put on a different, different, um, di on a different ground. And so, so if we look at this. Just really briefly, um, with in Badiou's ontology, I think we, we can get a kind of quick, a, just a snapshot of how this can help us think. Um, so I'm just going to tell the, the basic story of being an event. Okay. So any 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 thingness of the thing is co coextensive with this unity, but this unity can never be pre-given without falling into a theological mode of thought. Uh, that is to say, the irrational necessity of the one, or presence, or a merely ontic designation of objects governed by sui gen generic uh, natural language or the con contingencies of human cognition. The possibility of ontology, the theory, that is to say, the theory of being as such, requires the generation of the minimal difference. This is the difference of being as such and its immediate negation, okay? So non-being uh, and being. It is this relation that generates the minimum difference, but it is also this negation that generates the thought of being as such. That is, without difference, being as such floats endlessly between a quarrel of the priority of, its, of essence, of the one and the multiple, the general and the particular, and so on. So we have this set of, op with this, this opposition arising from the attempt to think being, which is being and its immediate negation. But this uh, oppositional configuration cannot resolve itself. So what, uh, what we do is we, we map this minimal difference onto, um, onto set theory. This is the move, this is the move uh, made by Badiou. Um, so what basically we do is we count this, this, this minimal difference as the difference between the null set and the void itself. Um, and it is the mark uh, or account that generates this first one, which is accounting of this negation. Hence, the minimal semantic commitments of set theory constitutes for Badiou the, the science of this difference itself. That is to say, um, the science of being. And this is perhaps the, the most quick way of defending the often misunderstood idea of the, of the Badiouzian uh, equation between ontology and mathematics. So what happens here? We begin with something dialectical and then move immediately diagonally or orthogonally to the negativities generated by the dialectical situation. Sticking with ontology, it is the dialectical nature of, of the identity of being with itself that generates the need for the negative moment in determining the ontological treatment of being as such. Yet, far from the Hegelian slogan, Badiou does not persist with the negative. Instead, as is my main point here, but you subtracts from the very opposition that would give rise to the positive negative opposition. That is, dialectics is employed by Badiou insofar as it is used to determine difference and, the, and to evaluate this difference. Um, yet, um, the ter uh, right. nonetheless, negativity does not, carry, uh, does not carry this difference through insofar as it does not determine the development of difference. One might call this use of dialect, dialectics hypothetical insofar as it allows us to identify and individuate the locality of negativity. 
In this sense, something like a subtractive method is not abstraction in the common sense. It's far from a theory of the negation of incidental or empirical features over the formal. A subtractive method is, is one that is inventive or creative in the sense that it displaces, dislocates the locality of negativity in order to constitute a new form of, 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 of discourse. And of course, in order to, for this new form of discourse to constitute itself, that break needs to be thought. That is, rather than remaining within the imminent critique of negativity, the subtractive method cuts off this di dynamic. To see what this means, we can turn to the problem of, um, I'll skip that section. <laughs> it's actually not that important. Um, so so just, just, to, just to, to recap that, that part, the, 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 the point is to, is to create some, develop some content for understanding what, uh, what, how this dislocation occurs. And, and I think um, the story I was trying to develop concerning Hegel's reading of Spinoza and Hegel's distinction between good and bad infinite is precisely shows you that, um, shows you the alternative the, uh, to what I'm proposing, right? It, the traditional way, traditional philosophical way of handling negativity dynamically. And, um, and so in, in a sense, my argument is a plea for the, for, the, for the bad infinite, right? A bad infinite that was able to dislocate itself from the philosophical net of the relation um, that, made it, that made the bad infinite the bad one. Um, and, and it involves a form of knowledge which I call the slave's knowledge, the, the, the knowledge of, of Mino's slave and of Leibniz's uh, boy. Uh, child, and and you know, used very efficiently by uh, by Wiedekind in the creation of modern modern mathematics, and yeah, and and I hope to to develop this idea a lot more in the in the coming year or so, and to be able to to uh, provide a more f uh, more full description of what something like a subtractive methodology would be. I'll stop there.